finest political satirist, live from Philadelphia, Mark Russell. It was once America's largest city, Philadelphia, center of culture, attracting many of the world's great philosophers, such as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Sylvester Stallone, and Bill Haley and the Comets. Philadelphia, a Greek word meaning city of brotherly love, is the birthplace of America, and its cradle is Independence Hall. The Declaration of Independence was signed here, and on that first day of the first Congress, they passed a congressional pay raise. On the second day, they took up government reform. Benjamin Franklin is buried in the nearby church grounds, and people often throw pennies on his grave for good luck. Which is ironic, since Ben once said, a penny saved is a penny earned. And didn't he also say, a fool and his money is probably a lobbyist? Nothing is more symbolic of Philadelphia than this 2,080-pound treasured relic of independence. Pennsylvanians paid only $300 for the Liberty Bell in 1752, and that was before it became damaged goods. It was rung every July from 1776 until it broke on July 8, 1835. They say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But in the case of the Liberty Bell, it is broke, and if they fixed it, nobody would come to see it. This we know for certain about Betsy Ross. She was a seamstress. Her husband was an upholsterer. Her grandson claimed that George Washington visited his grandmother and ordered a flag with stars and stripes, but there is no proof of this. For all we know, Betsy might have come up with a plaid flag or a paisley flag, but nobody saluted it. Philadelphians start out every new year with their colorful Mummers Parade. There's also a Mummers Museum. The original Mummers were mimes and African dancers. Ah, there's nothing like curing a New Year's Day hangover with some soothing banjo music. In addition to the Mummers Museum, there is also a soft pretzel museum, the Smithsonian of the snack. And someday, who knows, a monument to the beloved Philly cheesesteak sandwich, the Cholesterol Coliseum. It was W.C. Fields who lay on his deathbed in Hollywood and said, considering the alternative, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. William Penn founded Philadelphia after being imprisoned in his native England for being an uppity Quaker. He established the colony of Pennsylvania, but then made the mistake of returning to England where he was again thrown in jail. Penn's last words might have been, I should have stayed in Philadelphia. Well, next summer, the Republicans will be here for their 2000 convention, but I can't wait till then. I'd rather be in Philadelphia right now. Philadelphia, here I come, where the country started from. The founders assembled were all the best brains, like Benjamin Franklin. He flew his kite out in the rain, said, keep this country if you're able. Democracy will make it stable. Slavery, man, that's off the table. Philadelphia, here I come. You got two senators, your claim to fame, Arlen Specter and what's his name? With the Liberty Bell, you were taken aback. You were the first city to have a problem with some crack. Two, three, four. King George III, he cursed this town. Next summer, it all comes around when yet another George is crowned. Philadelphia, here they come. When royalty is back in town, Philadelphia, here they come. Thank you. Well, what better place to anticipate the coming millennium than the birthplace of our nation, Philadelphia? And everybody has been so hospitable here, especially our host, the crown jewel of Philadelphia station, public television station, WHYY. And they have been so... You don't know what a joy it is to arrive at the Philly airport and be greeted by the mayor. 
I don't either. It never happened. <laughs> no, I met Mayor Rendell years ago when he gave me the key to the city of Altoona. But let me tell you something. Now, your governor is Tom Ridge. And, uh, you know, he has the audacity to call himself a governor. He has never had an interview in Playboy magazine. <laughs> he never wrestled anybody, never wore a feather boa or purple trunks like some governors we know. And if you want to feel sorry for somebody, you got to feel sorry for the lieutenant governor of Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, this guy has got to be swamped while Governor Jesse Ventura gallivants around the country doing a spin on that Playboy interview in which he knocked religion. And so Jesse is saying, well, I believe in God. Yes, and I believe Ventura's deity is probably a big blowhard with a shaved head. Now... In Washington, we are at the height of our social season. Many, many gala events, a lot of farewell parties for Janet Reno. <laughs> the FBI still looking for that photograph of Janet Reno and Army combat fatigues charging into the Branch Davidian compound with a flamethrower yelling, Tora, Tora, Tora. <laughs> Six years ago, you remember, the FBI denied that they used an incendiary device down there in Waco. And that just a couple of weeks ago, since our last show, they admitted that they used it. Now, an incendiary device is a firebomb, right? And when they used it, it had an unexpected result. A fire broke out. <laughs> Well, Janet Reno is a graduate of the Wilson Good School of Pyrotechnics. <laughs> those of you around the country, uh, Wilson Good was a mayor of Philadelphia some years ago who went into the Guinness Book of World Records for being the first person to bomb an American city <laughs> since Grant took Richmond. Now, uh, speaking of bombs, uh, last week the Senate handed President Clinton a defeat and they voted down that test ban treaty. Now, I didn't think we had test ban treaties anymore, did you? Like, in the bad old days when all we had to worry about was Russian nukes. Uh, today, we got to worry about some rogue Pakistani at the L.A. airport with a cruise missile in the trunk of his taxi, or uh, <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi's cousin arriving in our shores bearing a Samsonite two-suitor with weighs 800 pounds. <laughs> During that test ban treaty vote in the Senate, that old wag, Senator Jesse Helms, uh, came out with this scenario that he posed. Now, I'm not making this up. And his message was that the foreign countries over there, and the European leaders and the president, are too cozy, right? And this is what Senator Helms said. He said, well, Prime Minister Tony Blair over there in England just says, yes, sir, President Clinton, whatever you want, and say hi to Monica. <laughs> Well, I have written an open letter to, uh, to Senator Deer, Senator Helms. Be advised that your fellow comedians aren't doing Monica anymore. <laughs> and neither is the president. <laughs> All right. I'm on the road most of the time speaking to groups such as yourselves, uh, many times smaller groups, sometimes just a handful of people. Groups like Puerto Ricans for Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> gay and lesbian Mexican Jews for Pat Buchanan. <laughs> this is a joke that works every four years, you know? <laughs> As you know, Pat Buchanan is about ready to join the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Reform Party to join Sybil Shepherd, Ross Perot, Warren Beatty, Donald Trump, Tweety Bird, and the Roadrunner <laughs> in making Jesse Ventura look like Winston Churchill. <laughs> now my dream ticket, ladies and gentlemen, for the Reform Party would be the ticket of Buchanan and Ventura. With that ticket, that would give me the will to live, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You've been reading all of these books that have been publicized lately. I don't know which one to read first, Edmund Morris's Dutch or Pat Buchanan's Deutsch. <laughs> now, Morris's uh, book, Dutch, is, uh, of course, a biography of Ronald Reagan. 
And he uses a very controversial literary device, Mr. Morris does, wherein he inserts his persona into Ronald Reagan's life. And my favorite part is when Jane Wyman breaks off her engagement to Edmund Morris to marry Ronald Reagan. <laughs> oh yeah, and then a few years later when Reagan marries Nancy Davis, Edmund Morris is the flower girl. <laughs> Now, Buchanan's book, whose real title is Let Hitler Be Hitler, says that in the beginning of World War II, if we had just let Hitler alone, just let Hitler alone, then he would have introduced casino gambling to Poland. <laughs> and when he inferred that the Republican Party, they all started ducking for cover, you know, really covering themselves. And Senator John McCain said, we got to get rid of uh, Buchanan. Uh, for saying that. Get, get rid of him. Uh, George W. Bush said, no, 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 keep him. We need that fascist vote. <laughs> Dan Quayle said, let's wait and hear Hitler's side of it. You know, so. <laughs> the last one. It's the last Quayle joke, I promise you. I just wanted to, to get it in. So it's got to be the Republican Party's worst nightmare going down in history as the party of Lincoln and Hitler. Um, <laughs> Is Pat Buchanan a Nazi? No. But if he runs as an independent, the Republicans lose Idaho. <laughs> there goes the skinhead vote. So this is my, uh, this is my favorite. My favorite part of any presidential election is a year ahead of time. We have all of these candidates all lined up. We lost one today. Elizabeth Dole pulled out of the race leaving husband Bob to campaign for John McCain publicly. So here we have now, kind of like an auction where the auctioneer shows off his wares. What am I bid for these specimens? Start the bidding right now. There's Bradley Buchanan and Bush and Gore. Stand up boys, take a bow. There's variety in this pack. On this you have my word. There's a basketball player, a big loose cannon, an empty suit, and a nerd. Behold Bill Bradley, he dribbles around New Hampshire on the stump. He came from behind to tie Al Gore, who says white men can't jump. Whether he gets a personal foul, or nothing but net, it's news. If he loses no sweat, his future is set. Commercials for Nike shoes. Behold this next audition prize, a mad bull who at the mouth foams. We got Buchanan from CNN. There's a place where the bull is at home. Perhaps a milder, quieter choice as Gore's chances grow dim. He thought he had the friends of the earth. They were friends of the earth, not of him. What do I bid for this Texas lad? His asking price is a rob. Hire this youth and I'll tell you the truth. His training will be on the job. His daddy will pay for him and so it's as if he was insured. But I can't give away the basketball player, the cannon and the nerd. a few kind words to say about George W. Bush. Relax. Uh, I do. The other day, he outraged his fellow Republicans. The Republican leadership in the Congress, which George W. Bush said, let us not balance the budget on the backs of the poor. Oh, the leadership went crazy. How dare he say that? He can't say that. It's heresy and everything. That, you know, George W. Bush has nothing to lose. When you're sitting on $100 million in your campaign chest, you can double date with Ted Kennedy and still get the nomination. <laughs> and any Republican who can outrage Tom DeLay and Dick Armey belongs up there with Lincoln in my book. Now, Al Gore has changed his, rep his strategy, as you know, the other day, he moved his campaign headquarters from Washington down to Tennessee. 
even though normally a candidate doesn't go back home until after he loses. Well, Gore, <laughs> now the way he described it, uh, so yeah, he's moving his entire operation from Washington's powerful K Street to Kmart. <laughs> Get it? Yeah, I hope that speechwriter got a bonus. Well, anyway, that's what he's doing. Attention, Kmart shoppers, Al Gore, aisle two. <laughs> now, he has opposition within his own party, as you know, in former New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley, who was endorsed the other day by the powerful senator from New York, the Honorable Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Moynihan, who said, Al Gore is unelectable. <laughs> Want to hear it again? Al Al Gore's unelectable. Well, I'm sure the Republicans will figure out a way to elect him, right? Ah, oh, well, let's see now. Who, well, about that time, there was, all these other people started falling in there, you know, like uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump goes on the Today Show, and they said, well, why do you want to be president? Trump said, because I'm a builder. <laughs> really? We kind of know that, right? <laughs> right? You want to build a bridge to the 21st century, and also a tunnel with a high-rise at the end. I mean, that'll be... <laughs> That'll be, the, that'll be the White House under Donald Trump. You're going to see a new White House with me in there in addition to the West Wing and the East Wing. We're going to put an atrium over the Rose Garden and raise the Truman Balcony 35 stories. <laughs> what is Donald Trump's religious affiliation? Masonry. <laughs> right about that pace, on a lack the pulp. Right about that time. Right about that time, we heard a long-awaited speech from that revered elder statesman, Warren Beatty, <laughs> who delivered what can only be described as your classic, old-time, liberal speech. The audience was limp with emotion. Ed Asner was burning his draft card. <laughs> B. Arthur was burning her, well, never mind what she was burning. So Warren Beatty said, where is the soul of the Republican, of the Democratic Party? Where's the soul of the Democratic Party? He said, where are the demonstrators? Actually, the demonstrators were out in front of the hotel, aging 60s hippies, demanding bigger cuts in the capital gains tax. <laughs> so the country, I don't know if you noticed this or not, you know, the country's in kind of a, kind of a funk, huh? I won't say malaise. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Bummed out on Bubba. He's no longer fun. Had it with the presidents. Bring back Coolidge, anyone. I'm tired and weary. With all the intrigue. Doctor says it's chronic. Clinton fatigue. I hear the thing's contagious. My vital signs are flat. Seven years seems like 20 And I'm a Democrat But I'm exhausted My eyes bloodshot Yeah, that's a diagnosis Clint fatigue, that's what I got Clint fatigue I've had my fill Not just of Hillary But also Bill Voted for him twice. Presidency was prized. But enough is enough. We gotta get the Clintonized and then recover from Clinton fatigue. Oh, it's bad, but not as bad as Gore fatigue. As Hillary Rodham Clinton seeks the Senate seat from the state of New York, attempting to appeal to each and every individual voting bloc in New York, the question is, will she and the president have Chelsea bat mitzvah? Now, <laughs> Puerto Rico enters into this race uh, uh, for some reason on several uh, uh, levels. Uh, about a month ago, the president released 
those Puerto Rican uh, prisoners who had been linked to terrorism some years ago. And Hillary said, yeah, let's release them. And she says, no, 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 don't release them. She says, well, maybe release one, see how it works out. Uh, <laughs> And they say that they never talked about it. The Clintons say they never talked about it. They talk about everything else, but they didn't talk about this. I guess it was one of those typical husband and wife conversations where he says, oh, well, I think I'm going to release those Puerto Rican prisoners. She says, I don't want to talk about it. Why don't you discuss it with your tart? <laughs> um, so Mrs. Clinton has been accused of using her access to her husband, lobbying her husband on behalf of favorite New York causes, as her opponent Rudy Giuliani is wondering, who do I have to sleep with to win this election? <laughs> so I, you know, I like to talk about issues. I, I you know, not just these personalities and, and all that. I was down in Alabama the other day. I spoke to all the, of the liberals in Alabama. We were in a in a booth in a little restaurant <laughs> and they were worried about the, their schools and uh, they were uh, they were worried because their schools are not great and they, they admit that the schools are, are an embarrassment to the people in Alabama they really are and no taxes for the schools they have fewer taxes in Alabama than in New Hampshire even where in their schools the desks have inkwells so and so the idea was to vote in gambling and then earmark the gambling proceeds to education and put a sign out on the highway, Welcome to Alabama, where literacy is a crapshoot. Now, <laughs> before we go, I just want to, I want to make amends to the state of Minnesota because they, they've had a tough time of it. And I, I know that. And I love, my mother was from Minnesota, really. And you know, I mean, it's a, it hasn't been easy with Governor uh, Jesse the Embarrassment Ventura. And so, uh, for Minnesota, here we have the Minnesota State Song. Oh, Minnesota, how proud you must be Basking in celebrity One year ago, your voters spoke and turn your state into a joke. A state so great with such renown has produced our latest clown. As you share him with us all, he's everywhere but in St. Paul. Feather boa, let me see. Purple trunks, who could it be? <laughs> I'll make one guess, I, I need no more. Minnesota's governor? <laughs> oh, Minnesota, do you groan? When he takes the microphone As he prances, as he roars Oh, Minnesota, he's all yours <laughs> Religion, that's for the weak I'm the only God I seek Navy tail hook, we're the best We're home from war we grab a breast as he prances, as he roars, oh, Minnesota, he's all yours, oh, Minnesota, your pride is yours to save. As Hubert Humphrey's turning over in his grave. Thank you. We love you, Minnesota. Which brings us back now to Philadelphia, where we thank you once again for your hospitality, and we honor the founders who, just a few blocks from where we are at this moment, drew up that Constitution, which makes it possible for me to stand up here and shoot off my mouth. You know, they were... <laughs> They were inspired, all the roasting we do, that's part of democracy. That's what Franklin had in mind with that roasting when he invented the stove. And so what there was, they were inspired by people like de Tocqueville, the French, Voltaire. And I believe it was Voltaire who once said, and I'll leave you on this, I believe I have it right. He said, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend with my life 
my right to tell you to sit down and shut up. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Thank you very much, Philadelphia. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Mark Russell Comedy Special was produced by WNED Buffalo, which is solely responsible for its content. This program was made possible.